alarm rings. Not really that late. Whew. In fact, hardly technically late at all. Ah, made it. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, December 9th. We will have a lovely midweek service tonight um, where we will get to talk about uh, the Annunciation to, to Mary. That'll be our, our gospel lesson for tonight. It'll be fun. So 7 p.m., uh, spread on out and all that good stuff. Or watch online. Um, we're going to get to 1 John chapter 3 today. And, and then we're going to dive further into the small coal articles. Now, just as a note, it has three parts. So part one, we all agree. Part two is this is where we can't yield. Part three is what we could discuss. So we're going to be doing part two, Roman numeral two, and then article two in there, which is on the map. So, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. So with that being said, let's begin Wednesday litany day. Awesome. So page 295 in your hymnal, the order of daily prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I want to bring up something. That idea of my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. A glory in the Old Testament is not just the, the praising of God, but the, the glory of the Lord refers to his, his presence. So there is this beautiful point that the praise of the Lord, speaking his word, implies that he is with you. You ever want God to be with you? Speak his word, because where the word is, the Holy Spirit will be there. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. So, with that being said, let us go and look at our psalmody. Our psalmody for today is Psalm 17, verses 6 through 15. We've been going through uh, the psalms in uh, our winkle, and uh, it's just with everything being so crazy and, and covid -y, uh, we we've spent more time uh, doing practical, how are we running our churches, how are we handling things, stuff. We haven't gone as much into the Psalms, but the Psalms are a great comfort, and we've enjoyed them as pastors. So, But Psalm 17, I remember our discussion on this one from three months ago. It was lovely. So, Psalm 17, starting at verse 6. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wing, from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They have set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children. They leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now to uh, one of my favorite epistle readings of the year, 1 John chapter 3. Uh, the reading is just 3, 1 through 3, but we get the whole chapter today. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 
only one student was not happy to be coming to preschool today. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and there is in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. For no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are, not, who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. <coughs> for this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, the Spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to bring up one thing that I, I taught this in the Bible study a long time ago. And in fact, it, it would be my go-to when I was filling in at a vacancy and I would teach there too. Um, but there's something I think very important for understanding what's going on in 1 John 3 here. <clears throat> one of the dangers is to, to want to look at other people and evaluate their work. I don't think so-and-so is loving their neighbor very much. Maybe they're not a Christian. Over and over, John says, we know. The point of this is that this is meant to be a self-diagnostic for a Christian. If you are a Christian and you want to examine your life, in other words, if you want to let the law of God speak and apply to you, this is what you look at. And the two things to look at are, are you loving your neighbor? That is serving your neighbor in actuality. And are you forgiving? Are you, are you believing in Jesus and his forgiveness and does the fact that Jesus forgives shape the way you go to life. So are you actively serving them and doing good to them? And when they have done ill to you, are you forgiving? Though th that's the, the give and take of the Christian life. That's the, the back and forth. We show love to our neighbor by doing active good for them. And when they have wronged us, we forgive. Th those are the two things. And that's what, that's what goes forth in the Christian life. Now, the, the way that Satan always attacks, and really, you can put it this way, every single attack that Satan does is designed to either not get you to love your neighbor, to give you an excuse to do them ill, or not do them good, <coughs> excuse me, or to hold a grudge against them, to not forgive them, to condemn them, because... 
if you're saying there's no forgiveness for them, you're really denying forgiveness. Because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if he's taken away the sins of the world, but not for Bob, because I'm mad at Bob. I don't think I know any Bobs at the moment. <laughs> then I'm really denying that Jesus died for Bob. And if he hasn't died for Bob, who else am I saying he hasn't died for? And so that's what Satan does. He tries to attack you in terms of your service and your, for and your forgiveness. So if you want to examine your life, ponder this. Whom am I not serving like I ought? Whom am I not forgiving like I ought? And then focus your eyes upon Christ again, because Christ Jesus never fails to serve you, nor does he ever fail to forgive you. And so that becomes the movement, that back and forth between law and gospel. And what we fail in, Christ is always fulfilling, completing, bringing about. And so this becomes the, 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 the diagnostic. And, and John begins this whole section, this chapter, by saying, we're going to be like him eventually. We're not there yet. Uh, when he comes back, we'll be like him. Right now, we're, we're not. But we're to strive after righteousness, the loving of the neighbor and the forgiving of them. Those, those two things define righteousness. Believing in Christ, that is righteousness. Receiving his righteousness is righteousness. Proclaiming his righteousness. All of that, all of that's wrapped up together. And so check yourself and repent and then live and strive after what is good and receive from Christ his good love and service to you and his forgiveness. So that's that, that movement. Now, we're going to apply what we've just heard and look at it in terms of what Luther brings up in, in the small called articles. Because we're going to talk about the Mass. And when Luther talks about the Mass, he is referring to the entirety of the Roman Catholic communion services and practices. The, the whole kit and caboodle, not just communion itself, but everything that went along with it. And uh, some of the stuff we, we dropped. And he's going to discuss why, and I'm going to say it gets in the way of either loving your neighbor or proclaiming Christ's forgiveness. I'm guessing that'll dovetail here very well. I don't know. We'll see, because I haven't read the small cult articles in a while. I am rereading this live in front of you, so if I get caught off guard, that's why. So, uh, Article 2 of Part 2 on the Mass. <clears throat> the Mass in the Papacy has to be the greatest and most horrible abomination, since it directly and powerfully conflicts with this chief article. Uh, the chief article is that Jesus Christ alone is our Savior, which we receive salvation through faith. For this sacrifice or work of the Mass is thought to free people from sins, both in this life and also in purgatory. It does so even when offered by a wicked scoundrel. Yet only the Lamb of God can and will do this, as said above. Nothing of this article is to be surrendered or conceded because the first article does not allow it. If there were reasonable papists, we might speak moderately and in a friendly way. Let's say. Again, Luther's preparing. He thinks he's going to die, and he's, he's old and cranky by this time. And yeah. So, first, why did they so rigidly uphold the Mass? It's purely a human invention that has not been commanded by God. Every human invention we may safely discard, as Christ declares, in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Let me uh, explain that very quickly. Uh, after we receive the Lord's Supper, it is our custom to sing the Nuc Dimittis. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. We could omit that. We could skip that. We could sing a different song there. It's just a human custom. A wonderful one. I love it. It's one of my favorite parts of the service. But it doesn't make forgiveness or the Lord's Supper what it is. Rome, though, had taught that you had to do everything this way, and this song, and this one, and this prayer. Otherwise, it was all bad. But if you did all the, if you followed all the steps, then you were doing a good work that made God happy. And that's what Luther is speaking against here. So, um, second, the Mass is unnecessary. It can be omitted without sin and danger. All the Rigmarole. Third, 
the sacrament can be received in a better and more blessed way, indeed the only blessed way, according to Christ's institution. Why then do they drive the world to woe and misery for something fictitious and unnecessary when it can be had in a different, more blessed way? One should preach publicly the following to the people. A. The Mass as a human invention can be left without sin. B. No one will be condemned who does not observe it. C. They can be saved in a better way without the Mass. I wager that the Mass will then collapse of itself, not only among the crude common people, but also among all pious, Christian, reasonable, God-fearing hearts. This would happen all the more when people hear that the Mass is dangerous, fabricated, and invented without God's will and word. Fourth, the Mass should be abandoned because so many unspeakable abuses have arisen in the whole world from the buying and selling of Masses. Even if the Mass in itself had something advantageous and good, it should be abolished for no other reason than to prevent abuses. How much more should we abandon it since it is also completely unnecessary and useless and dangerous, since we can have everything by a more necessary, profitable, and certain way without the Mass? Fifth, the Mass is and can be nothing more than a human work, as church law and all books declare, even when it's performed by wicked scoundrels. The attempt is to reconcile oneself and others to God, and to merit and deserve the forgiveness of sins by grace by the Mass. This is how the Mass is held at its very best. Otherwise, what purpose would it serve? This is why it must and should be condemned. For the Mass directly conflicts with the chief article, which says that it is not somewhat which says that it is not someone paid to perform the Mass, whether wicked or godly, who takes away our sins with his work, but the Lamb of God, the Son of God. The idea in medieval Catholicism was that the priest could be paid, and I could just go say the Lord's Supper, do the Mass, do the whole service, off in the corner by myself, and you could apply the merit to that to yourself, to Grandma and Purgatory, or what have you. It was totally a... a transactional approach. And in fact, you didn't have to receive the Lord's Supper to get the benefit. As long as you paid me to do it, you got the benefit. What does that have to do with Jesus or forgiveness? Nothing. And so this is what Luther is, is speaking to here. Now, uh, para, uh, paragraph eight. If anyone says he wants to administer the sacrament to himself as an act of devotion, he cannot be serious. If he sincerely wishes to commune, the surest and best way for him is the sacrament administered according to Christ's institution. To administer communion to oneself is a human notion. It is uncertain, unnecessary, and even prohibited. He does not know what he is doing because without God's word he follows a false human opinion and invention. It is not right, even if done properly otherwise, to use the sacrament that belongs to the community of the church for one's own private devotion. It is wrong to toy with the sacrament without God's word and apart from the community of Christ. Let me uh, comment on that. I, I am the pastor here. I, I, I administer the communion. And when we've been online, if there's been no one here who wanted communion, I, I didn't get communion that day. Because I'm not here just to commune myself. And I don't commune just myself. But if someone wants communion, I will commune with them. Again, because it's a community thing, and it belongs to the community. Ah, communion belongs to the community. Imagine that. The old Roman Catholic custom, in fact, even today, if you are a priest, you are obligated to say the Mass every day and thus uh, perform the right sacrifice to grant merit, and you often might just do it by yourself. Luther's like, no, that's not the point. The point of the Supper is for the Church to gather around Christ's Word and receive His body and blood. This article about the Mass would completely preoccupy the Council. <laughs> Even if they could concede all the other articles, they could not concede this. Cardinal Campagius said at Augsburg that he would rather be torn to pieces than give up the Mass. So by God's help, I too would rather be burned to ashes than allow someone paid to perform, uh, than allow someone paid to perform a Mass, whether he is good or bad, to be made equal to Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior, or to be exalted above him. In this we remain eternally separate and opposed to one another. They know well that when the mass falls, the papacy lies in ruin. Before they will let this happen, they will, if they can, put us all to death. And that's where we're going to pause for the day.
the church cannot run by fear. And the church cannot run on transaction and business and money. Uh, yes, we do need money to, to operate. Please do give offerings. Uh, we're also a little short on mission. So if you want to think about kicking in a little bit more for our admissions account, the Northern Illinois District would thank you. But it can't be a matter of, I've sinned, therefore I better give the church some cash. That, that, no, because that has nothing to do with Jesus. Um, this is one of the things that we get in the small catechism. Who is Jesus Christ? He is true God, born of the, uh, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary, who has purchased in the one me, a lost and condemned person, not with silver or gold, but with his precious, holy, innocent suffering and death. And that's the point. Salvation, forgiveness, always has to be something free in Christ. But everything else beyond that is, is dross, and it can be dropped freely. And if you said, no, we have to do, you, you have to pay the certain priest, otherwise you don't, yeah, you, you have to pay the, the pastor 25 bucks when you go up to communion, otherwise it doesn't count. No tip, no Jesus. No, that, that'd be utterly wrong. But that was almost what was going on uh, at the end of the Reformation. And, and one of the things that does happen is uh, at, at the uh, Council of Trent, Rome does pull back on some of the most egregious abuses. They do listen to some of what Luther says here, but they keep a lot of what's going on. Uh, Vatican II, they removed a lot of some of the other things too, but this is what Luther was referring to. So. We're getting a lot of church history here. I like church history. If you don't, I, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. But it lets you understand why we do what we do. Um, all right. With that being said, let's confess the creed and then we'll pray the litany. So, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Litany. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the craft and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord, <clears throat> to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, to comfort and help the weak hearted and the distressed. We implore you to hear us, good Lord to give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to
to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women, child, and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanders, and to turn their hearts. To give and preserve for our geese the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Concluding Prayers Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my beings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. All right. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.